Welcome to Tales from the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Mick West. My guest today is Alex Dietrich. Alex served a 20-year career as a naval officer and fighter pilot with two combat deployments. She was also deployed to Afghanistan as an infrastructure reconstruction engineer. She then transitioned to academia, serving as a naval science instructor and then a military professor, teaching, amongst other things, critical thinking, leadership and ethics. Alex is best known to the public as one of the pilots who witnessed the famous Tic Tac UFO when flying off the USS Nimitz in 2004. She's appeared on 60 Minutes, CNN and other shows to discuss her experience and its implications for flight safety and national security. All right. Well, first of all, Alex, thank you very much for doing this. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's, it's great to talk to you again. It's uh, It's been, I guess, a couple of years since we, we had our little uh, conversation uh, about uh, some of the technical minutiae of the, the Nimitz incident. Uh, and so, you know, we'll touch on that, I think, eventually at some point. Uh, but first of all, I think, you know, I'd like to kind of establish what our common ground is, because I think you know, maybe some people you know, listening and watching this might think, you know, here's two people on opposite sides, like one of them is an ally of the UFO community and the other one is, you know, trying to prove that aliens don't exist and these are two people at odds. So, you know, it's kind of something I I recommend in my book is is establishing common ground, as you know. Uh, so I want to start actually with... Uh, yeah, I just want to say I have oh. your book. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And, and a uh, few bookmarks in it, I see. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I've marked it all up. I really enjoyed it, and I appreciate all of your efforts. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate that. I appreciate that, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, and, you know, kind of what I was thinking first is, you know, obviously we have that in common, but you know, we also have the the fun thing, which is clouds, which is kind of a shared interest that uh, kind of cropped up. We were both... Uh, you know, members of Cloud Appreciation Society. Are you a yes. member? Or are you just, I am a uh, member. I'm yes, sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I think I, I did join at some point, but I think my membership has lapsed, but I'm yeah, a member of all the, the Facebook groups. So tell me, like, yeah, how did you actually, how did this, your, your love of clouds develop? I've always been a fan. Uh, I grew up in Chicago uh, with the Art Institute of Chicago there, and they have the big canvas of George O'Keefe's Sky Above Clouds, and that was one of my favorite places to go and visit with my grandmother. And uh, it really inspired me. You know, she, my grandmother explained to me that Georgia had painted this uh, during one of her, or after uh, one of her first rides in an airplane. And that perspective of being above the clouds, uh, you know, it really um, sort of planted a seed in my mind. And then when I started to fly and uh, you know, be in and among the clouds. It just really felt like home. Yeah, yeah, that kind of uh, resonates with me a little bit because uh, I think my kind of romantic notion of clouds goes back to a book I read as a child called uh, Biggles Learns to Fly, which is this old, uh, I think Biggles was like a, I don't know, turn, middle of the century, last century kind of detective series. And his background, where he was in the RAF, and this this book was all about him learning to fly. And there's this one passage in the book where he's like up amongst the clouds and then he flies over this giant kind of hole in the clouds and sees a tiny little plane at the bottom of it. And it just, you know, kind of, yeah, made me, uh, made me like want to learn to fly for one thing. And also like, you know, fostered my, my love of clouds. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, something I wouldn't say we have in common, but uh, I, I did actually take flying lessons about 20 years ago uh, and got all the way up to doing my, my long distance solo. Uh, so yes. flying is something that uh, uh, yeah, I've always been been interested in and, and, and aviation. And obviously you, like, how did you, did you learn to fly in the Navy or was it something you did before? I did. Um, so that, this, you know, the story of going to the Art Institute and seeing this big painting uh, and and then starting to travel again with my grandmother. This is um, a woman who, uh, you know, practically raised me and spent all of this time with me and, and exposed me to these opportunities, uh, good education, but then also to travel uh, and art and, and, and science and all of that. And so, uh, you know, the first place that she took me on an airplane was to Florida, to Disney World. And hmm. I thought this is this is magical, you know. If, if the actual uh, flight itself was amazing, but then it also ended up in this incredible place, um, and so I was really uh, hooked. And then um, I had a, a high school college counselor 
who, um, you know, they gave us some standardized tests and they sat us down and said, you know, you have to choose a college and a, you know, a backup and, and uh, declare a major. You have to have a five and a 10 year plan for your career. And um, I said, oh, you know, I'm not really sure what I want to do with my life. And uh, Mr. Hernandez was his name. And I said, um, Mr. Hernandez said to me, okay, picture this. I want you to picture yourself when you're 40 and then look backwards. Um, you know, what do you want to accomplish and who do you want to be at that point? And I thought, oh, okay. Um, well, all the 40 year olds I know are uh, getting divorced and going into a second career and having a midlife crisis. And he said, no, 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 <laughs> that's not what I meant. And I said, no, actually, this is, you know, thank you, Mr. Hernandez. This is actually really helpful because um, maybe I should get my midlife crisis out of the way first up front, you know, while I have uh, good eyesight and, you know, the body and, and energy for it. And so um, this was, you know, 1996-ish, 1997. And um, I thought, you know, I'll either be a rock star or a fighter pilot, um, but I'm tone deaf. So the music was out of the question. Um, and so I said, well, I'll go into the Navy and fly and have an adventure and travel and see the world. And uh, it just so happened that the um, the timing of my graduation and commissioning in 2001 uh, coincided with, you know, the events of 9-11. So that for me uh, was a, a paradigm shift. You know, I realized literally overnight with the towers falling that it wasn't about me and my selfish adventure that I was a part of something bigger than myself. And I needed to figure out what that meant. You know, I was an officer. I'd taken an oath. And I'd sworn, uh, you know, to support and defend the Constitution. And I needed to figure out what that meant and how I was going to contribute in a meaningful way. So, yeah, that's uh, sort of a short yeah. story. Well, it's much, much more impressive than my backstory, which uh, <laughs> does actually uh, like a grandparent uh, plays a part in it. And that my grandfather was kind of triggered my interest in programming computers uh, at a fairly young age back in the, uh, I guess, the 1980, about 1980. Uh, and you know, I, I just followed that. And, you know, <laughs> it was kind of a, a path of least resistance in some way. You do something, there's something that you're good at and you follow it and you you do that. So that's how I kind of ended up being a, a video game programmer and uh, now a, a UFO video analyst. So uh, I think like, you know, the... The other thing we do have in common is this kind of, uh, you know, appreciation for critical thinking. And you are someone who, after your career in the Navy, which we'll get back to, uh, you you were teaching courses in, in leadership ethics and critical thinking at uh, George Washington, and you've taught other courses of you know, similar nature. Um, how how did that come about that you you became you know essentially an expert in in that domain so the first 10 years of my career in the navy i was operational so i was flying deploying uh, i spent a year boots on ground in afghanistan uh, because my undergraduate degree is in civil engineering and uh in 2000 well 2010 2011 um you know we'd been in Iraq and Afghanistan at that point for a decade, and uh, personnel weren't re-enlisting, uh, the officers weren't recommitting to their their contracts, and so they went across all of our records are electronic, and so they uh, searched for folks who had degrees in civil engineering to go over and uh, basically rebuild yeah. everything that we had previously gone over and blown up. Um, so, you know, the roads and bridges and schools and uh, police stations, courthouses, things like that. So anything that would support education and economics and rule of law. And uh, yeah, I got the call. They said, we need you to go and do this, <laughs> do this tour. Uh, and, you know, the karma, of course, was, was not lost on me. <laughs> but I was going back over um, after having carried ordinance uh, yeah. in, the, in the previous deployments. So um, my good deal payback for doing that 
that tour was to come back and teach at George Washington University and the Consortium of Schools there in, in D.C., Georgetown, uh, GW, Howard Catholic, and the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is a, you know, a nice opportunity to just relax and decompress after that dynamic tour. Uh, but it turns out I really like teaching. And they said, hey, you're pretty good at this. How about coming down the road to the Naval Academy? Uh, in Annapolis, which is just outside DC. And, uh, and so that's where I, s- I spent another seven years. Uh, so 10 years total uh, living the charmed life of an academic as a, a permanent military professor in the Department of Leadership Ethics and Law. And uh, the law there being our JAGs, uh, the JAG officers who are um, experts in law of the sea and how, how to make sure you're giving a lawful order and right. uh, committing a war crime, you know, <laughs> those important things, the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, but then, of course, the uh, the leadership and ethics side of it being uh, the psychologists, uh, the sociologists, and the philosophers. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, teaching classes and, and working with those colleagues, uh, you know, at the root of it all is really uh, you know, what are we doing and, and why? Uh, what do we know and how do we know it? And uh, you know, thinking critically and, and developing these officers and these future leaders, uh, yeah. because some of them will make a career out of the military, but many of them will transition into the civilian sector, other industries, careers in government. And so we want to make sure that they uh, think clearly and can make good decisions. Yeah, I've always been, always been fascinated by that aspect of the military, which I think a lot of people don't really appreciate, is just how much academic excellence there actually is uh, within the military. Uh, I think there was a Pentagon uh, program called, I think it was Brilliant, Sh- Brilliant Soldier or something like that, where it's basically like you, you you have to train people in the military. They can't be just you know grunts. They have to be people who have, they have this deep understanding of what they're doing, especially the people in in leadership positions, uh, which is what what you're really addressing. Right, and we, you know, we often remind our students there at the academy that uh, everybody graduates with a bachelor's of science, even if they're an English major or right. a geography major, uh, because they have to take so many technical courses. Uh, because a lot of what we do is technical, whether you're flying an F eighteen or uh, driving a submarine, uh, but it is a liberal arts institution. It's a liberal arts education. And, you know, one of the first things I do on syllabus day, first day of class is is break that down in the Latin. Uh, you know, liberal doesn't mean like we mean it in yeah. left and right politics, but it means, you know, education worthy of a free man, a free thinker. And hmm. reminding the students, you know, why we are uh, stretching their minds in ways uh, and ways and giving these different frameworks uh, because, you know, none of them are necessarily better than the other, but they need to be able to, um, you know, sort of be this um, uh, almost like a, I'm thinking of the atomic, uh, you know, switching back and forth between mindsets and um, right. taking the different perspectives and challenging their assumptions and making sure they uh, you know, turn the data over and over <laughs> and examine it from every angle uh, so that they can make, again, good decisions that are going to, in the case of these future officers, really have high stakes of, of life and limb. And- yeah, the highest stakes, really. Yeah. yeah, it's it's fascinating. Like, and you know, critical thinking. Um, I I come from like the skeptical community, and I go to like skeptical conferences, and I read like Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Like, I've got some issues of it back on my shelf there. And you know, skeptics are very big on the idea of critical thinking. But w- when I've you know, kind of looked into what they mean by it, we get all these different definitions of what people actually think critical thinking actually is, and I, a lot of people kind of just hand wave it as being thinking very well or thinking uh with you know thinking smartly about things or things like that like which obviously you know isn't particularly useful it's just like try think harder uh so when you're <laughs> when you're teaching critical thinking you know what what are the actual 
you know, the 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 basic fundamentals of critical thinking that you you are teaching. Yeah, well, I love to promote the criticalthinking.org uh, organization and and the resources that they provide, um, and I'd love to hear more about the conferences and um, circles you know that you're a part of uh, and that network of you called it the skeptics. They have yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to be speaking at one of their conferences in in Las Vegas, uh, the CSI Con, the uh, Committee of uh, sorry, the the Committee of a Skeptical Inquiry. Oh, uh, cool. They are they are various different uh, acronyms that they kind of use interchangeably, uh, and it's it's an interesting uh, community, and I, I say community because it kind of reminds me in a way of the the UFO community. I've also been to UFO conferences as well as skeptical conferences, and you know in both. Uh, both domains, you you get a, a subset of the general population, and so you get the same wide variety of people uh, in uh, skeptical conferences as you do in uh, UFO conferences. You know, some of them brilliant people, and some of them, uh, you know, just ordinary people, uh, and some of them not necessarily the the nicest of people. Uh, but that's that's true, I think, across both communities. But uh, but yeah, like critical thinking, it's um it's something that i think people everybody says they do or they think that they do but they don't really know exactly what it is and i think i've looked up definitions of critical thinking and some of them are really really complicated and it's almost impossible to understand what they're actually talking about and some of them seem a little a little divergent i mean would you have a, a if someone said what is critical thinking what would you say yeah well it's thinking about thinking mm -hmm. meta thinking <laughs> It's, it's thinking about thinking with the aim of improving your process. And um, and right. again, I like criticalthinking.org uh, and the work they do is because they have these, uh, they have a, a pocket guide. So this is something that I include in my textbook, uh, you know, required uh, reading for every semester, even in classes that I teach that don't necessarily have a, a clear connection, you know, I have a, I was teaching an elective on change management and um, I, I include this pocket guide because it's not very much. <laughs> and the students, you know, it, it's a little paperback. Uh, what I like about the criticalthinking.org materials is that they have a spectrum of uh, books and posters and workbooks. They even have a, um, you know, activities, uh, kind of like mm. a deck that you can do from elementary school all the way to you know college professors who are teaching higher ed and want to um, leave their students with something that they can take into the workplace and to a career and um, so I, I give this to the students and I say hey, this is a, this is literally a pocket guide stick it in your pocket you know stick it on your desk and and use it as a reference whenever you feel um, writer's block, or you feel like, you know, you're working on a project and you're just sort of stuck in your own thinking, in your own head, pull this out and go through the elements of thought, go through these. A lot of the prompts are questions um, rather than, you know, sort of statements that, that guide you. And so um, then we do an activity on day one, the first day of the semester. And um, what's funny is that even before I sort of came out and became popular after the 60 Minutes piece. Um, I was doing this as an exercise in my class um, where I would say on day one, okay, we're going to talk about critical thinking and we just need a topic here. Um, so, you know, do you want to talk about the opioid epidemic? Um, do you want to talk about gun control? Do you want to talk about climate change? Or do you want to talk about UFOs? And 99% of my students say, uh, you know, oh, let's talk about UFOs. And yeah. uh, this is before they kind of knew who, who I was in relation to that topic, uh, because it's just sort of this fun, funny thing. It is. And, um, and so, you know, I write it up on the board, the, the elements of thought, and we go around this, there's this the framework is sort of a wheel um, and you can start anywhere in the wheel. And, um, you know, the, the students tend to start with, you know, what is the question at issue? What, like, what are we talking about here? And so 
um, then they quickly get stuck on it, right? <laughs> and so uh, the, the they question whether, you know, are we talking about whether UFOs exist? And then I said, well, what, what do you mean when you say mm -hmm. UFO? And then we skip right over to the assumptions uh, wedge of the, the circle, which is, you know, are you making the assumption that UFO is a euphemism for flying saucer with an alien inside? Yeah. Extraterrestrial or non-human intelligence, um, whatever whatever term we want to use, or are we simply saying, in the pure linguistic sense of, of unidentified flying object that we're talking about, things that are in our skies that we're observing but cannot classify. Um, so you know, to kind of bring it back home to the incident that I was involved with, uh, in. In November of 2004, um, the question at issue is, you know, was there something there, there, uh, that we saw that couldn't be, you know, that was truly unidentified? Um, and then if we say, yes, you know, we believe the air crew and the radar operators and other people involved, then the, you know, another part of this, this model is, why do we care the purpose mm. and so this is the question that really i saw the nasa independent study struggle with both when i um, was invited to dc to sit in on their first session and then when they recently had their publicized um, televised um, session you know they're struggling with this existential question of Okay, there are things that are flying around that we we can't whether it was the you know the Chinese balloons sort of crossing across the states uh, in slow motion, um, like why do we care? Yeah, and then you'll see the different agencies uh, arguing. You know, the DoD will say it's a matter of national security, you know, with a capital S. Uh, the FAA will say it's a matter of flight safety, you know, another capital S safety. And then the academics and the scientists at NASA and across the uh, universities will say it's, it's a matter of science. You know, if there's something out there that we don't understand or don't know, um, then we, you know, science with a capital S. So security, safety, and science are kind of the three things. But then that quickly spins you into these other angles of, um, you know, who are the stakeholders and who's responsible, uh, who's going to pay for it. Uh, if you're talking about having sensors, cameras, radar, FLIR, uh, and then the subsequent analysis of all of that information, you know, we we're talking about big data sets and probably applying AI and machine learning and then that sounds like it's going to cost a lot. <laughs> and, then, and then who has access, you know, yes. that information once it is analyzed. So, you know, you can sort of go around and around, but, but asking these questions of what are the assumptions that we're making? What, what information do we actually have? What data do we have? And this is really interesting because the students, you know, and they've only, most of them been exposed to Hollywood ideas of UFOs mm -hmm. or that language. And so they don't, and just as I didn't before I was sort of unwittingly thrust into this topic, um, they don't know about things like Project Blue Book or right. um, SETI or these other organizations that are you know, trying to tackle and collect information and create an archive of documents or uh, sources. And so, you know, when I say, you know, what information do we have? Where is the data? And um, and is it reliable? You know how do and and if we're talking about gathering information going forward, how would we go about that? And how would we make sure that that uh, integrity of the of the information is maintained? And getting back to the point of of who has access, um, yeah, to scientific research or national security, you know, defense 
Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the UFO discussion is kind of framed as you know the government knows what's going on and they're refusing to tell us. Uh, but you know, really, there are these you know these these three uh, domains that you mentioned, like national security, um, safety of flight, and and science. Uh, these three kind of you know, imperatives that people have for why they they want to study it, uh, and you know a lot of what's actually going on is is really just not this you know fight for disclosure type thing. It's actually people studying it. You've got like RV Loeb doing doing science uh, type stuff, and you've got uh, you know NASA just starting to get into it, and I guess they're going to be collaborating with the FAA, uh, so that kind of covers you know two domains there. Uh, the flight safety with the FAA, and but also the the vast databases that the FAA has is something that NASA could use, and then they could use the the artificial intelligence to try to do the uh, patterns of life analysis to see if things pop out. And NASA themselves have access to all kinds of sensor technology with uh, their satellites and various other sensors and things that they have like that. Um, so there's there's very much like a a big program of of studying these mysterious things flying around in the sky. But then there's also this other thing on the other side, which is that there's this, this vast suspicion that there's some secret program uh, that the government already knows what these things are to a large degree, and they've already discovered uh, things about them. And then so you've got this this weird weird conflict. Uh, and I think that the conflict kind of came up in the, the recent hearing uh, because you had... You know, on the one hand, you had the two pilots, Ryan Graves and Dave Fravor, and then you had David Grush. And David Grush is saying, you know, we have this this weird secret program uh, of reverse engineering. And Ryan Graves and David Fravor are basically both saying that, you know, there are safety of flight issues and there are, there are mysterious things. We don't know what they are. Uh, you know, maybe they're aliens. Uh, actually, that's kind of, I, I read a, a good quote of yours uh from an article that you wrote, I think it was, uh, I can't remember where it was now, but it was, uh, I'll, I'll put a, a link to it. But you you, you said, uh, are UFO reals? Yes. Are they a foreign adversary? Maybe. Are they extraterrestrial in nature? It's possible. Should we keep investigating? Absolutely. So you know, you're kind of covering all the bases there, which I think is, is great because you know we have this this uh this situation where everyone's really interested but there really are like you say these very different perspectives uh within that and uh yeah, how 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 do you you know in your mind kind of reconcile the difference between um uh, you know what david grush is saying which is all about secret craft being recovered and what ryan graves and david fravor are saying which is more about you know pilots seeing things in midair yeah, I thought it was really interesting at the hearing, especially the way they had them seated at the table, mm -hmm. uh, that they put David Grush between Fravor and Graves, because I, I thought they should have put Graves and Fravor together, because we were really ha on this sort of, yeah. of conversation. And not to say that one was better or, or right, uh, just they were so different. Um, and that the pilots were discussing these encounters that we've had uh, on operations off the East and West Coast uh, in these military aircraft and the concern about having things. And again, we, they, in the, in the purest sense of the term, are unidentified. So, you know, we can describe what we saw visually, we can describe what the radars were seeing, we can describe these unusual characteristics. But I didn't hear Graves or Fravor uh, classify them in some context. You know, they didn't say these are Russian or these are clearly extraterrestrial. They just said, hey, we've got some unknown, unidentified things that are flying, and that is a problem, especially around military exercises, military hardware, uh, and our coast in a post 9-11 era, if we have things that are close to our population centers, our US citizens on our homeland, I mean, that's the hair on the back of my yeah. neck stand. Yeah. We need to be able to identify these. Then, you know, you had David Grush discussing 
uh, these accounts that he had gathered over the course of his work, his uh, you know on duty assignments of investigating uh, you know whatever it was that he was doing and uncovering evidence uh, or or test other people's testimony uh, that there were exotic materials and biologics, uh, which is interesting, um, but also such a different story than what the pilots are trying to relay. So I almost felt like there should have been two separate hearings yeah. uh, or, you know, take the hearing and break it up into these two, uh, two different um, tracks, because I felt like we were kind of crossing our, our wires there and, and getting the messages confused. Um, yeah, I don't, I have never heard of the, you know, what David Grush was discussing. Um, I don't have any reason to, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting, um, assertions that he made. Um, and I, I cannot comment on them because I have, I have no reference and no experience with anything that he's talking about. Something that I thought uh, was a really important nugget. I mean, everybody's sort of going off on this sensational idea of, you know, that we have a flying saucer and it's it's a pilot you know, in the basement somewhere. Um, but I thought even more important than that, or something that I would really hope Congress would follow up on, is this idea of funding streams and how programs that are shielded by these highly classified, you know, compartmentalized um, protocols are able to uh, submit for and receive their funding without providing accountability. And um, I, I saw a couple of members of, uh, of, you know, the representatives of Congress who perked up at that and said, I think they asked us some following questions about how we might make sure that um, our taxpayer dollars are actually mm -hmm. uh, at, uh, not just on a on worthwhile programs, which again, we can go back to arguing the, the why, the question at issue and the why, but, but really, you know, that we have, I, I hate to use the word transparency because <laughs> our fast and loose with it now, but the, the accounting piece of this. Um, right. That yeah, have, especially contractors of the military industrial complex who are just kind of getting away with shenanigans, you know. Yeah, I think that was something that um, Acacia Cortez uh, brought up. Uh, she, you know, she's had some dealings with the, uh, I guess, the military industrial complex and that type of thing, and and funding for for contractors, and she's managed to get millions of dollars returned. So it's something that's of interest to her, uh, and it could be that some of what David Grush was butting up against was that kind of you know vested interests in in funding and perhaps even slightly shady funding uh, for for secret programs and that might be why he was you know turned back at certain points. But of course, he's also making much broader claims than that. That he has a whole bunch of witnesses who have explained to him where the sources are and maybe where the bodies are. I'm not sure about that, but you know certainly that there's a he claims a reverse engineering program uh, that's going on that's that's very secret and compartmentalized, but also going back a really, really long way, uh, like going back to the 1940s and uh, involving you know this this flying saucer or flying craft uh, that was recovered by the Italians in 1933 in Magenta, Italy, and then the Pope helped them smuggle it out, helped the uh, the OSS smuggle it out uh, of, of Italy back in the forties, forty four, I think. Which seems, you know, what I mean, the, the, the claims seem ridiculous. You know, to be blunt, uh, I mean, how? What's what's your your feeling and your reaction to the extreme nature of the the claims that are being made? Yeah. So one of the things, and it, I just can we go back to the intro that you gave me of, of that I was an ally of the UFO sure. community. Um, you know, I, I really hope that people see me as aggressively neutral, Okay. You know, that I'm not a, a skeptic and I'm not a UFO person, um, but that I am open-minded, uh, and 
ask that that uh, demand of myself and ask that others think critically uh, on any of these topics. So, so I just want to do that little bit of um, um, revision there on how I see myself in this in this space. Uh, in a lot of these um, interviews, I get asked about the conspiracy or the um, the thought that that. I get asked about our particular incident that there were sort of men in black who came onto the carrier and took some some tapes or or cartridges and you know sort of whisked off on a helicopter. Um, I didn't see that, and at no point in my own encounter, uh, or you know, I had a tour at the Pentagon. Uh, I was an admiral's aide, and I I worked you know for for years there in. Uh, the the nerve center of of what we're talking about, and I never had the sense that there was a cover up or an attempt to cover up. And, you know, I certainly dealt with and and was read into classified programs, but each of them, you know, it made sense. And um, what I try to remind people is that, and this goes back to Hollywood doing us a big disservice is that people have this assumption that the Pentagon and these agencies, the three letter agencies are somehow uh, sort of omnipresent that all of these sensors, right? People keep saying, Oh, we need to get the data. Like they have the data and they're just not releasing it. We don't, we do <laughs> like, we're not, yes, we have satellites. Yes. We have high resolution cameras. Uh, I carried one of my F-18, um, we have radar, we have FLIR, we have all of these things, but they're not going 24 seven and they're not going everywhere all at once, all the time. And so, you know, part of what I'm advocating for is that, hey, if we see something that we can raise a flag and get those sensors into that part of the sky or that part of the earth to capture, uh, or that all of this information might even help us predict where we might see something and have things waiting. But, you know, I think a lot of these conspiracy theorists have this assumption that we're always collecting, like we always have eyes watching everywhere, and that we have this information on some hard drive in the basement of the Pentagon, and we're just not releasing it. But that is um, a really false right. assumption um, and and so in my experience working in the pentagon and um and interacting with folks there is that these people just as i was there you know they they wake up in the morning and they have to commute and they have to you know park and they have to get in it's kind of like going through airport security and then they get to their little desk with their cubicle and they um, you know, spend 25 minutes trying to log on because their password is expired uh, and it's the Pentagon. So it's, you know, highly secure. But but then, um, you know, you, at that point, you need to go get a cup of coffee and then you know, it's lunchtime. So these are just people doing their best, um, but they're not uh, some sort of... Um, sort of higher level being that has right. this ulterior motive. Um, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of red tape. There's a lot of uh, getting locked out of your computer because your password's, you know, not working. And so when people assume that there's just this really, um, like, I don't know, maybe you have a better word for it, you know, that the, the government is doing something i'm like man the government is made up just a bunch of people like you yeah and me. yeah yeah i and think the uh, the idea of the it that some of these conspiracy theories uh require a, uh, uh an incredible level of competence yes. uh, in, in, and not in, to say in... that they are incompetent but to go back to your point of this idea that you know the pope helps smuggle a crash saucer somewhere in 1933 I just can't imagine that something like that would have been kept secret for so long. Yeah. I, I, again, I'm, I'm not qualified to to comment on that, on that particular assertion, um, but I just, that seems like a really 
Um, well, I think that particular story is something that's actually been knocking around in in ufology for maybe like 10, 20 years or so. Like I think there was an Italian researcher who wrote uh, a book or a, a blog post or something about it and produced these documents of telegrams from Mussolini. But in Italy, it was generally considered to be like that he'd made this up. He was just, you know, forged documents and stuff and not a real story. And yeah. gr when Grush came along, he kind of added an extra layer on it, which was that the uh, the OSS, which I think is the precursor of the CIA, um, worked with the Pope to get this, this craft transported in the 40s. Uh, and that was that was the new thing that the Grush had claimed. But you know, the, of course, the big thing there is that you know, we've had a flying. Well, not, I think it wasn't the flying saucer. We shouldn't really call it that. It was uh, a cylindrical shaped craft of, with windows, apparently. Uh, and we've had that somewhere in a hangar for the last seventy years. And I think that is probably the thing that is is kind of defies credulity and the idea that that can be kept secret for so long but you know then people will point to various military things that have been were secret for a long time i mean is is it plausible in your mind that we would have had alien crafts for 70 years and we're only just finding out about it now again i i just the feasibility of it seems like a stretch. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we had a hangar, uh, just the logistics of it, you know, who's paying for that? Um, and, and it seems that it would need security. Uh, you know, it seems like you would have a whole, like generations of people um, who who would have been read in. And so, uh, again, I, I can't speak, I don't really know much. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, even the lore or, you know, sort of the. Well, people do come up with with reasons. Like they say that it's uh, being kept secret successfully because it was moved to private industry and the private industry is the one that's actually running it. And they kind of dis divorced themselves from it. The government people like separated. And so it went to like, you know, Lockheed Martin. Uh, and and other Boeing and companies like that, military industrial complex companies, and they said, "Here, take this and do something useful with it. That will help the country, and we'll look the other way." Uh, but even there, you, now you've got like a whole bunch of different people uh, with, you know, perhaps not even as good security as as the Pentagon has. Yeah. You know, now you've got Boeing and and Lockheed Martin, which obviously are very high secure companies with the secret stuff that they do, but still. Hundreds, if not thousands, of people must have must have learned about it. It does, you know. It's it's you, know, you can't really argue from incredulity, uh, but you know, the the fact that it, it is so um, amazing, I think, uh, means that we do need to ask for more actual evidence. Uh, so here's I'll go back to our critical thinking discussion, though. Yeah. So the question at issue here is whether or not there is a crashed Italian alien ship uh in custody of, of one of our u.s defense contractors that's the question at issue yes or no but then my mind immediately says well so what who cares like i don't really care <laughs> i don't really well, care, do care. <laughs> do, do you, but why why does it well matter? I because if it if um if we have an alien craft that means that we have aliens have visited this planet and that means that kind of science as we know it uh could be revolutionized uh by this fact at, at least you know the, the our understanding of the universe we revolutionize because we know that there are alien beings who can fly around and come here uh but we also know that we're in possession of alien technology that could potentially revolutionize uh technology and industry and uh, the, the world as we know it, and certainly science, and would just simply be very interesting uh, to study. And there's also the implications of aliens are real and how that uh, would affect uh, you know, the, the zeitgeist, the whole thing with the ontological shock. So for me, it would be like super interesting to find out if that was true. So I would, you know, if there's a possibility of finding out, I would definitely want to know. Okay. So here's a, Here's a game. Yes, it's true. We have a we have a crashed spaceship, uh, non-human intelligence with this you know a smattering of biologics included. 
how does that change tomorrow? Like, what does that ontological shock look like? Or what does that mean for our markets, for our tech? Uh, I mean, if we've had it for yeah. 70 years and we don't have, you know, we're, we're still driving fossil fuel cars on the road uh, and, you know, struggling with uh, s- s- spiral of doom, climate change, you know, like. Well, that, I think, like, I, yeah, I see your point because you're saying, like, you know, nothing's happened so far mm-hmm. we've we've had all this and so um, did this reverse engineering not work you know, some people say that the reverse engineering has been slowly drip dripped into into mainstream science uh like things like transistors came from from it and uh you know even like um memory metal and various other little things that we think are the product of science and almost certainly are the products of scientific development they say that they come from this but for me like you know if, if you would if someone were to tell me yes it's real then my reaction is tell me more like what's what was real you know what are we actually looking at here what does this craft what does it look like what does it do what is it made of what is what is the analysis that has been done so far and then why why haven't we been told about it why has it been covered up for so long what was the reasons you know there's all these immediate questions that that come out of it and, you know and maybe Maybe we don't get any new science out of it. Maybe it's just something that's so far advanced that it's just this artifact that we we can't even study. Uh, but you know, that's again something I want to know. It's it's the the idea of like this such a a universally amazing thing being kept in a hangar somewhere at you know Wright Patterson Air Force Base that that could could potentially change our understanding of the universe and certainly would change at least the idea of you know, are we alone in the universe which is this this fundamental question that that everybody including science has i think it's i want i want to know i would want to know that mm. you wouldn't <laughs> it doesn't bother me that much right yeah i, I want to say it bothers me but uh i i want i you know i i, I am, i'm excited at the prospect if it is actually i don't think it's true is the thing but if it was true it would be so fascinating yeah that i you know be the most interesting thing in the world for me at that point huh. see i'm much more uh you know concerned with uh the opioid, opioid epidemic the right yeah. situation in Afghanistan right now, uh, the gun control debate in our own country, climate change, right? <laughs> there are a lot of other things that I um, would like to figure out. And um, if 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 the answer is yes, we've had this thing in our possession for 70 years, um, then I kind of say, well, it obviously isn't doing us a lot of good. <laughs> and for me, the question at issue is, you know, do we have it? Yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then the, per- the 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 so what is now we're talking about an issue of trust. Mm-hmm. Now we're talking about an issue of um, you know withholding that and and the question of whether or not we are entitled to it as as Americans if we're you know sort of paying into this military industrial complex via the the Pentagon uh, spending or you know, as as a human race that, you know, it crashed in Italy, but it belongs to everyone because it's it's our planet that it crashed into. So um yeah, I just for me it doesn't Yeah, well that's interesting. I think people might be surprised to hear you say that. Uh but yeah, it's uh I suppose like, you know, you were talking about real issues proximate issues and more tangible issues and things issues that we can actually do something about uh certainly are things that you know obviously we should be devoting a lot more resources to uh if not all of our resources and you look at what you know, the pentagon is doing you know, they've got a, a budget of a trillion dollars and they're spending a few tens of millions on this uh but they're they're spending it really i guess mostly for the national security and the the, the safety aspects of it, not really for the you know scientific archaeology of crash flying saucers, as far as we can tell, unless there's some actual secret program which will come out later. But yeah, let's let's talk about the the real issues there. Well, sorry, one more the thing in the critical thinking wheel that I want to hit is the the assumption and the assumption that the and and Mike sort of just the feasibility or the logistics of it again is 
how would it be that we have all of these encounters of UFOs from different witnesses uh, and whether they're lore or actual accounts of, of crashes, how would it be that the government has managed to take possession and custody of all of this material? Yeah. How, how would it be that we don't have, um, you know, even meteorites that come and, and, you know, land, we have people who have them in their private collections. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they crash so into people's is, houses sometimes. And Right. And so my question is, you know, getting back to this sort of Hollywood um, trope that we have that the men in black just arrive on scene immediately after the crash and you know, come out and um, bag everything up and, and take it home. Um, I just don't see that as being feasible. Yeah. Yeah. Having been on military operations, <laughs> having, having, um, you know, been part of a quick reactionary force in Afghanistan, like it takes a minute to mobilize and it takes a minute for information to flow. And so it seems to me that if, if we're talking about, you know, this is the skeptic in me, if we're talking about all of the um, supposed encounters and crashes that, you know, at least some of them would have ended up in pub the public domain. Yeah, you think? Or I, I've read this, raised this point uh, before, and uh, I was told that the U.S. has rapid reaction forces stationed in every country just for this eventuality. <laughs> they, they have that's why we have military bases in all these different countries, so that they can rush out and uh, grab their flying saucers. And then, of course, there's countries that we don't have bases in, like like Russia and China. Right. Uh, do we have them in China? But yeah, they, they we don't, uh, you know, we can't obviously go to some remote village in Mongolia if a flying saucer crashes in in probably less than 24 hours, really. Uh, realistically, it, it doesn't really make sense. So like, yeah, where is the public domain crashed flying saucers? Uh, so I, you've, you've told the story of your encounter numerous times and we don't really need to go over it again but uh there's if you don't mind there's just a couple of little questions i have about it like i, I know like you know it's been a very long time it's like oh, is it like almost 20 years now yeah uh, right. and uh and memory changes over time but it, last time we talked we talked about the differences in your recollections of like the eight to 10 seconds versus Fravor's five minutes. And we try to reconcile that. Like having thought about that since, what's your kind of understanding of what went on about uh, uh, as to how you arrived at that discrepancy in time uh, for the sightings? Because I think you both said that was for the time from from the merge plot uh, and the the initial immediate sighting of the, the Tic Tac object down by the ocean to the the object whizzing away yeah and so this is another thing that people keep bringing to me and mm. i i just sort of shrug it doesn't bother me and it really doesn't not make sense to me um because when you're in two different aircraft uh you know imagine that you and i are driving down the road in two lanes uh sort of in the same traffic flow and you know, there's something crazy that happens over on the side of the road. We're both, you know, have these two different uh, sort of physical perspectives and and also our sense of like when the incident started is going to be different based off of when we actually visually acquired uh, what it is that we're looking at. And then, you know, my position in the flight, I was dash two, I was the wingman. So I have a very different responsibility than the lead aircraft where David Fravor was uh, flying. He has the luxury of, of not having to keep track of me. Mm -hmm. uh, my flight is uh, to follow him and to make sure that I'm deconflicted, uh, meaning that I don't crash into him um, and that I don't lose sight of him. So um, I was new in the squadron just a few months, uh, just out of flight school. Uh, so my scan is slower, you know, I'm much less confident with the systems and the maneuvers and everything else. 
than somebody of his rank and experience and expertise. You know, he'd been there, you know, he'd logged thousands of hours at that point. Um, so it doesn't really, I would, I would be surprised if we had the exact same timeline and the exact same mm -hmm. uh, sort of account of what happened because we were again in these different positions and these different perspectives. So. All right. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I guess it's one of those things, obviously we never get, it's, <laughs> we're talking about two different people's memories of things that happened a very long time ago. So yeah, and, and yeah it, like you say, you'd expect differences. What's really interesting. And this is again, the sort of the difference between the question at issue, which the question at issue is how long, how yes. long were, and, and again, the merge plot is, is not a crisp, clean, flip the switch, hack the clock moment in time merge plot is a call that the radar operator will yeah. make to indicate that hey i see these two little blips on my screen converging now's the time to, for you to switch to your short range radar mechanics in your aircraft and then also to be looking outside to get a visual tally um but you know that that's seconds on either side and um you know somebody calling out that there was a disturbance in the water you know, certainly took a minute before, and I say a minute, probably a few seconds before everybody else was looking down into the water and getting that, uh -huh. um, that visual tally. So, you know, I think all four of us, if you tried to line up the actual physical yeah. uh, events with where we were in our, um, in our visuals, that it would be four different, four different timelines. Uh, but there was something else I was going to say. Oh, um, this, uh, Dave Beatty, um, oh, yeah. Beatty why he, he recently put out another iteration of his um, video recreation. Uh -huh. And I, I think he's really talented. I, I don't know how he does it, but um, I think it's fascinating that there is this compulsion, um, not just by him, but, you know, this whole community to sort of recreate or, or, conjure this scene um and and this gets to my question of why right um because i don't think that we're ever going to figure out what it was that we saw that day yeah yeah my why my purpose well you know i was really hounded <laughs> to to come out and talk about it publicly um not that I was hiding anything or that I wasn't, you know, trying to be open about it, but I had already debriefed um, in November, 2004. I was already debriefed by folks at the Pentagon. I spoke to folks at Congress. I'm not trying to convince anybody. I'm not trying to make the case for the Tic Tac. Um, but what, you know, my why, my purpose is to say, hey, we saw something unidentified that day. And we didn't have a good, process we didn't know ahead of time that the radar operators were seeing anomalous hits on their radar so we need to do better as a team to give our air crew and operators a heads up before they go just trundling into that situation again in the future make sure that they have good procedures for this is i mean we have procedures for everything we're pilots we have checklists emergency action procedures. So, hey, if you see an unidentified thing, step one, turn your tapes on. Step right. two, call it out. Step three, separate the aircraft and get people in these different perspectives to get different angles on it. Step four, look for these uh, characteristics. Step five, you know, what, we didn't have any of that. So we were really just like, wow, ah, what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, making it up in the moment. And then when we got back, we didn't have a standard debrief template. Hmm. Which again, we have for everything else we do. If we go out and put bombs on target on time, we come back and we have this very clear, systematic way to debrief it and to turn over the evidence so that they have the bomb damage assessment, the BDA, so that they know the collateral damage, so that they know, you know everything that was involved in that execution of a target we didn't have any of that when it came to talking about a ufo and yeah. so being able to 
trigger that response from other, maybe other agencies, maybe get that satellite, you know, that's on the other side of the world, you know, spun around as soon as possible and focused in the area. Like, that's really what I hope comes of it. Not that we somehow manage to go back 19 years and sort of be in that moment in some sort of um, immersive uh, what's it called where you have the virtual um, reality yeah some sort yeah. Of like, but it's almost like people want to be there they, they I, want well, that I, and and they're unpacking it in these little micro details which again there were four of us um, in our particular visual encounter and so we're all going to have these different angles on it yeah yeah I think you know my why there is is that I, I view these things somewhat as a puzzle. You know, obviously there's very important issues involved, but when you get an individual case like this, or like a lot of the videos that you see out there, I see it as a puzzle where you've got certain pieces of information. Like here we have your different accounts uh, uh, and, and other information that we have. And can you use that to at least resolve certain aspects of what happened? Like, for example, the, the flight path of the object. Is there something where we can create a flight path of, of this thing that uh, correlates with uh, both or all three or all four uh, reports, which might then tell us something about what actually happened? You, know, you get a little closer to... Yeah, I, I, excuse me. I really don't think you, we will ever solve this case unless there is some some trove of hidden data that the, the military has, like some tapes, which seems unlikely because they've said that they don't. Uh, but yeah, you know, we might be able to form a better idea of what, what happened and perhaps rule in or rule out some hypotheses. You know, like I had this hypothesis I discussed with you that it might be something like a balloon and that uh, it was like a parallax illusion for when Dave uh, David Fravor was seeing it move. Uh, now let, let me ask you this: Like from your perspective, like the very last thing that happened, Fravor's uh, describing it going around in a circle, and he's going around in a circle, and it's it's on the other side of the circle, and he cuts across, and it it flies across from him. Uh, do you remember it departing in essentially that that exact same way? being departed in the whole scene or yeah like when he because like, that's that was like the last time he saw it was when it basically he flew towards it and he described it as kind of like coming up and across uh, and above him and disappearing off back behind him to the left you're up uh i think maybe ten thousand feet higher or something like that looking down uh and you know, what what did that look like from your perspective when it flew off yeah, uh, I mean, it's, again, it, it wasn't following any of the, the physics that we as aircraft follow or expect to see when we are either engaged, uh, you know, coming into, we call it BFM or ACM, so uh, basic fighter maneuvering or aerial combat maneuvering. We're used to seeing the changes in um, sort of the, the angles and the expecting a certain turn radius. Um, it wasn't following any of those, which is why it was so, it was like glitching our brains um, in terms of, of its its maneuvering. Do you remember yeah, so, like at the end, like what happened? Like the last... It just, it just, it was just gone. So like it accelerated rapidly in one direction... But not even, so again, like we plug the burners, we, we put our throttle up to max mm -hmm. and there's, you know, an acceleration. You're implying that right. there's a, an increase, just as we see it out on the highway, you know, a car will step on the gas and then it'll start to, to pull away. Okay. Um, it didn't do that though. It just so, instantaneous acceleration. So, but could you see it moving it, or did it, did it vanish? It it vanished. It disappeared in terms okay. of it was it was oh, gone. I don't, yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> sorry if I'm like uh, pushing this point, but just to be yeah. clear, like you know, it, you could say we've got like a here's my little model tic tac here. 
Yeah, yeah. So oh, if, okay. it's, if it's if it's if it's right. a jet, it, it kind of accelerates and you go flies off. Uh, and if it's like you know, kind of uh, uh, something that's defying the laws of physics, it's just going to do this shoot it out of a gun. instantaneous, like you know, yeah, poof, like, like that. Shoot it out of a gun. Or, or does it just simply completely vanish? You, you, you just can't see it anymore. You don't actually see it moving out of the side. Or, or did you see it moving very rapidly? Shoot it! Shoot it out of a gun. Okay. Yeah, All and right. then try to follow it with your eyes. Okay, so you couldn't see it moving. Or could you see it moving like a streak of light or something like that? It, no, it was like it was like gone in a second. Mm. So like try to follow a bullet out of a gun. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't but, even see it though. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like I mean, it, if it had teleported to the moon, uh, like and just disappeared from that thing, would that essentially be the same as what you're seeing? Or did did you definitely get an impression of speed? Velocity. I don't know, because I've never seen anything teleport before. Well, <laughs> yeah, you've seen it on TV. So, Nick, I don't, like, the reason I'm so hesitant to go down this no, rabbit hole with you is because, you know, I'm not qualified to make this analysis, and I don't want to speculate, and I yeah, don't want yeah. to throw fuel onto the fire for folks who are either trying to say, you know, oh, yes, this was definitely NHI alien tech, or, you know, this yeah. was can be totally debunked in a way. I think it's really important to maintain the um, sort of the pure uh, account that we had in the moment that we came back and reported to our yeah. uh, intelligence officials and our chain of command on the aircraft carrier uh, as part of this carrier strike group, this battle group of ships uh, conducting this sophisticated military exercise. Uh, off the coast of of California in a pre-deployment capacity, getting ready to go out and, uh, you know, go into a combat zone. So so we were all serious, sober, focused, and concerned uh, that there was something that we encountered that didn't adhere to our, you know, certainly wasn't one of ours. Uh, it wasn't um, sort of a blue tech uh, or or another aircraft that we could identify. And then you know, we're conditioned to think friend or foe, that it, it has to be hostile or, or not. So we're thinking it must be some adversaries tech. Uh, and and then regardless, you know, so we're thinking security, but then we're also thinking our, our butts are on the line. Like we're out there flying around. Uh, safety of flight is a concern. Um, if, if there are things operating in what should be a controlled airspace, mm -hmm military operating area, a MOA, we call it. Um, so so for all those reasons, you know, we came back and we raised the alarm, um, you know, and, and went, you know, on the record. But again, there really wasn't a clear yeah. record archive or a record process uh, for that. Um, so I'm not, yeah. not really interested in getting to the bottom of it, uh, sort of solving that mystery. You know, thank goodness nobody was harmed, that there was, you know, no mishap, um, that that we didn't lose any any lives or limbs or aircraft in the pos in the process of this encounter. Um, yeah. So maybe another reason that I don't feel this, you know, it's not like a murder mystery for me. <laughs> well, it is, it is for me. I mean, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and uh, I, I... Yeah, obviously, it's my interest here. I, I don't want people to think that I'm trying to get you to say something that would disprove the alien hypothesis or the the advanced technology hypothesis or the, the diminish in any way like the the issues of safety of flight. You know, my interest here is trying to figure out what might have happened and if there's a way you perceived something like you know the way it departed yeah. uh, that was kind of either the same or different from Fravers or just giving a different perspective on the same thing that might be helpful. So, uh, so asking one eyewitness out of four visual and, you know, let's say a dozen people who were involved, radar operators and people in the E2 mm -hmm. and the Marine pilot who saw the thing in the water and the other two from our squadron who got the flare footage, taking just one person's perspective uh, from this and then asking them to, 
you know, sort of solve it or find that missing puzzle piece uh, 19 years after the fact yeah. <laughs> uh, isn't, is not going to work. Um, no. you know, critical thinking model says, Ooh, this isn't really the, the, the evidence or the, the information. But you're part of the puzzle. Uh, in the, I, I've spoken to Kevin Day uh, and a, a few other people from the, the ship, uh, Gary Voorhis and Mike P.J. Hughes. Uh, I haven't managed to speak to David Fravor. I may, I think he doesn't want to speak to me, but you know, if if you could put in a good word, I'd love to you know, have a have a chat with him about this this type of thing, uh, mm-hmm. if he's interested. But yeah, I, I definitely don't think you can solve it by getting one perspective when all these other perspectives are 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 out there. But um, you know, it's. But really, what my hope is that when somebody sees something tomorrow. Mm-hmm. next week or next year that we have a process in place that we have a way to that they are prepared uh that they you know are able to capture more and and better high resolution data in the moment um but then also that oh, I've got a, got a ufo here in the- <laughs> <laughs> um that they are uh that they're equipped, literally, yeah. hardware, uh, you know, cameras and FLIR and and radar and everything that they need. But then also that there's uh, that they that we have their back, that we have that that quick reactionary force uh, to come in with you know other better, more powerful sensors, and that we can can capture a lot more of those puzzle pieces you're talking about in the moment and in the immediate aftermath so that we can then make sense. Yeah. That's really Yeah. Cool. No, that, that would be great. Cause you know, I, I want to solve cases is, is my, my thing. And you know, if there's more data, yeah. uh, we will resolve things and perhaps be able to shine some perspective onto previous cases. If we can resolve something that happens now with higher fidelity, it might teach yes. us something about, about the past. So one thing that people keep, asking me or that I've been asked several times years after the fact was, did you see a shadow? Mm. (laughs) I don't know. I wasn't looking for a shadow, but you can be damn sure that if I see something weird tomorrow, the first thing I'm going to do is glance down and (laughs) and see if there's a shadow, if it's casting a shadow. Uh, You know, those are the sorts of things that we can do to calibrate uh, and to prepare ourselves to be better eyewitnesses and to be better um you know stewards of this information for that next um that next encounter if it yeah. and also i don't want to suggest it would be really irresponsible to uh, imply that these encounters are all in some way related so just because i saw something weird on november 14th 2004 does not mean it's the same tech or of the same origin as the squadrons, the, whatever they were seeing on the East Coast years later, right? So I go back to this it's unidentified by definition. And so we need to be better about our process of identifying and not making assumptions that this is all, you know, some. Do you, do some you think, do you think this process is actually is actually improving right now? Do you think there's, there are steps going in the right direction? Like, what do you think of, say, Arrow, for example, uh, what they're, they're doing? Is this is this helpful? Is it working? So I don't really, I, can't, I don't have the perspective to say definitively. Um, I was heartened by Dr. Kirkpatrick's testimony um, or, you know, when he spoke to the NASA group and then also mm-hmm. when he spoke um the Congress. I I get the sense that they are, you know, sort of trying to solve and resolve these old cases, cold cases. Uh, but I don't get a sense, and I have seen nothing to suggest that there is a systematic mm. approach going forward for for the operators of the future who are going to have encounters or for the citizens, uh, you know, the citizen scientists who uh, are driving down the highway. What about the long haul truckers and the train engineers and the people who, you know, are out there 
looking looking at the horizon, uh, looking at the sky, hopefully sober, hopefully, <laughs> you know, awake. Um, but I think they have just as much of a of a chance of seeing things. And then, you know, what? How do we channel that? How do we get them to report? Do we yeah. have a hotline to call? Do we have an app? Do we have a website? Like, and and how do we make sure that they know what information to capture and and to relay in that process? Um, but I haven't I haven't seen anything. And maybe that's something that'll come after the NASA independent study recommendations are published. Uh, you know, maybe they'll say, yeah, we need to have a an interagency office that we staff and and fund to okay. do this work. It, it kind of seems like, you know, you talk about long haul truckers and uh, train conductors. Uh, you said there was someone or you were in a, you were in this Transamerica train and the conductor told you that they'd seen a UFO flying by the side yes. of the plane. Yes. And like, yeah, people the see California these things. Zephyr, oh, and, yeah. and I was just sitting in the observation car and I, you know, nobody sort of spotted me or outed me, <laughs> uh, but the conductor was giving this um the description of the you know the geology and the rocks as we went through Utah and um mm -hmm. formations and all this and all out of nowhere he starts talking about this UFO <laughs> uh that flew up next to the train and hovered alongside it and he nudged yeah. the engineer next to him and they said oh you know that's weird and then it zipped off and um I just sort of you know I, I don't know if I was reading your book at the time but I slowed you down in my seat and, you know so, yeah. uh, but um it got me thinking you know what of course here i am you know advocating that we listen to pilots and give pilots a a place to report and a mechanism to report but we should be advocating on behalf of all of these operators whether they're on the ground or in the sky or at sea that's you know, interesting ship yeah like uh ship captains like yeah uh, actually there was like there was a a cruise ship captain i think who was uh showing ufo video but i think yeah the thing is you know eyewitness reports are great but you want video and if we've got like if a trucker's driving along and the trucker sees a ufo if he has a good enough dash cam if they have a good enough dash cam then it should show up on that and that's you know, obviously something that you think would happen with the pilot sightings as well. You know, it shouldn't be too hard right now to get cameras that are of a, a similar fidelity to the human eye. If you have a you know, pointing in enough directions that would cover everything that the pilot would see. And so when a pilot gives an eyewitness report of seeing a UFO, they should be able to just go back to the camera. Uh, but yeah, you that seems, think. yeah, yeah. You think <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who's going to pay for all that hardware? Who's going to yeah. pay for it installed and integrated? Who's going to pay for all of that uh, information to be downloaded and stored on on what? What server? Where? You know, the mm -hmm. flap, that costs money. Uh, and then if you're looking for the needle in the haystack, you know who who's actually going to analyze that? And AI. Use? AI will do it. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, 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 you need the motivation, but we do have, you know, the, the triple uh, motivation that you mentioned earlier of, of national security and uh, air safety and, and science. So it, it seems like, you know, if, if there was, you know, evidence that pilots are seeing these things on a regular basis, it, 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 for me, it seems like an obvious thing, next step to do, but I guess we're not quite to that level of, uh, of motivation yet. So one of the um, briefs that the NASA independent study had last fall uh, in their two-day conference was a brief from a group in France that um, I thought I was really impressed with the way they described their relationship uh, with, so it seemed to be this sort of nonprofit group of citizen scientists, but they had this really um respectful and, and functional relationship, working relationship with local and national authorities. So, I mean, we're talking about a much smaller geographic area and a much smaller population, but 
the stigma and taboo of the issue. Yeah. Again, this is by their accounting is so much lower and people know, Hey, if I see something light in the sky or, um, you know, some, something weird, then I can, um, get in touch with these folks. And then they go through the process of contacting the, you know, whatever are the equivalent in France of a sheriff's office or police, uh, but then also their army and, and air force. And, and they said, you know, our, our goal is actually to, to make sense of these things and a resolve and to give people peace of mind that, oh yeah, what I saw was a commercial airliner, but the, um, you know, meteorological di- conditions were, were making some strange illusions or um, one of my favorites. And this is, I think a story out of Australia, the, the village was seeing these, amazing strange uh lights in the sky and it turns out that a local cannabis farm (laughs) that normally had these automatic shades on their on their greenhouse windows you know this the mechanism mechanical thing broke and so and so it was foggy that night and so the cannabis lights the grow lights i don't know if they were purple or what um, but they sort of reflected off of this low cloud cover in a way that the village um, a couple miles down thought, oh, well, you know, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Alien yeah, invasion. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, they called uh, the local authorities and said, you know, I'm seeing Armageddon. Uh, <laughs> and the authorities, you know, said, oh, no, that's just the cannabis farm. Yeah. Um, so, so this group in France, you know, they said, you know, we like those stories because people are empowered and encouraged to report, hey, you see something strange, we want you to say something. And, and then all of these agencies cooperate to get to the, you know, to gather the yeah. information and to share reports and, and to then let the people know, you know, this is what it was, or this is what we think caused it. Um, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, yeah, so you know, how do we get to that level of um, yeah. functionality? <laughs> I think yeah, there's there's like there's issues the with where we are in the in the states. I mean, part of it is just this reporting stigma and uh, things like airlines uh, not wanting their pilots to even talk about uh, the subject. Uh, but also, like, there's yeah, I, I think. A lack of information perhaps for for the pilots like they don't know always what they're looking at uh something that's come up recently quite a lot is is these starlink sightings which aren't the 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 dots that move across the sky which people have been seeing as ufos but rather like little kind of uh dots of light that kind of grow and then shrink away like far away on the horizon so they look like they are like hundreds of miles away and they look like they're in space because they are in space, but they're 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 actually Starlink satellites. But there's been a large, you know, almost like a rash of reports coming out from pilots, uh, especially on transatlantic and transpacific uh, routes, seeing them in um, in in when they look towards the north, towards the Big Dipper. And I think Ryan Graves mentioned the Big Dipper uh, in his his in his testimony, but. Uh, whenever we were able to get the the information about where the pilot was and what direction they were looking in and what time it was and the the uh, the date, you can figure out you know exactly what they're looking at. And it turns out that the Starlink satellites moving across a patch of sky which is exactly forty to forty five degrees above the sun, which is the perfect conditions for the Starlinks to reflect off, and it creates this this strange illusion which looks like various craft going in different directions when it's really just multiple things going across and then multiple things going across that way. But it, it's one of these things that it almost creates conflict because the pilots report and to some some degree they have to like go around their their bosses because they're not supposed to be like taking video in the cockpit and then they take a report and then it gets explained as Starlink and it becomes disheartening to them and then other people uh, you know there's conflicts between other people because some people say we well, got to trust the pilots it can't possibly be starlink so uh, you know we need to get to a better a better system and I, I i agree with a lot of what you say and what a lot of what ryan graves says and dave fraver that we need to get rid of the stigma we need to uh have better procedures for reporting things and we need to have uh training for the pilots so that they're able to 
you know disambiguate things figure out what things are and uh and also um could take better records of of these things but where we are right now it's a bit of a mess uh, it's kind of unfortunate but yeah you know, so you th- you think we're we're making progress would you say we're, we're better now than we were a few years ago so again i I'm, i don't think i'm qualified to yeah. <laughs> to say one or the other um I, i'm not privy to the efforts uh you know of arrow um, besides yeah. you know, having conversations about our, my own encounter. Um, but I can say that in these interviews and being um, approached by popular media, uh, CNN and NPR and um, News Nation and those, that there's a lot less snickering, that there's a lot less uh, of the, the spooky music intro yeah. uh, when, they, when they bring me on. And so... I appreciate that the conversation in in the, at least the popular sense is, has been uh, seems to be indicating in my narrow um, experience that that there is a reduction in the stigma and the, the taboo that people are saying oh well, maybe we should take this seriously and um, yeah I appreciate that. but in yeah. terms of what I would agree making and um, you know I I think these hearings that just happened will hopefully lead to um, some commitment of actual funding and authorization to uh, proceed and and in a balanced way that the security, safety, and science, um, you know, so that we don't have it all siloed in one DOD or or other uh, agency. So I, again, I think that those are very nascent efforts. I think that that's really just the suggestions and the, mm-hmm. the existential questions of what are we doing here? What are we talking about? <laughs> and and what's the what's the point? You know, what's the goal here? If we're going to spend right. all this, yeah, um, and and then you know, all sorts of questions of privacy. You know, this came up with the Chinese balloons uh, that were that were going across the U.S. People said, "Well, who has jurisdiction here? Because it's not the DoD." We're talking about U.S. airspace, um, and if we're going to point some, you know, high-resolution cameras and, and sensors in the area, it's going over people's backyards. It's going over private property and uh, schools and uh, you know, my YMCA. I don't want yeah. the government, you know, peeping in on me while I'm in my Zumba class. Uh, <laughs> you know, it seems absurd, but but really, we are need to wrestle with all of these issues and, and seeming contradictions that we have for a need for privacy and um, also this desire to have all the facts and know everything that's happening everywhere all at once. Um, and those yeah. are really at odds with each other. Oh, I've kept you here for like an hour and a half now, uh, but I do want to ask you, like, uh, you, when you lifted my book Isn't it up, you have a different sense of time. Indeed, yes. <laughs> I thought it was only ten minutes. Uh, yeah. it's, it's you. You held my book up earlier, and you had like a whole bunch yeah. of little uh, bookmarks in it. I'm wondering, like, what, what, what you thought about it, and perhaps more specifically about what you thought about the UFOs. But in general, what do you think about uh, the book? What was your impression? Yeah, no, again, I really appreciate um, because you were able to, especially in the early chapters, articulate so much of what I've been feeling, but haven't Mm. had uh, a model or framework for. So what was really helpful for me was, um, you know, understanding, you know, the the sort of the, the, um, I love the visuals here of the, you know, not just why people believe conspiracies, but how, like how they proliferate and how um, the slippery slope, you know, people get sort of a whiff of something and they get pulled into and pulled down. And I love the the title of rabbit holes. Um, And I like that that you have these different case studies for um, this phenomenon, this sort of psychological, sociological, anthropological um, affliction that we have here, yeah. uh, whether we're talking about you know the coronavirus, 
vaccinations or um, I, I really wasn't aware of or following at all this whole 9-11 conspiracy. Yeah. Um, well, that's that kind of, really... It's one of those conspiracy theories that's been on a slow boil, I think. Obviously, it was very big you know, sh- shortly after 9-11, but it's one of those well, things I'm, like I'm... JFK. There's a lot of there's a community of people who believe very strongly in various conspiracies around 9-11, some of them quite extreme conspiracies. I because of my own personal timeline of my career, like I said, I you know, I went through ground school that summer and then I had my first flight on 9-11 and then very quickly ended up in a pipeline, um, the strike jet and strike fighter pipeline that had me um just completely consumed and isolated in this um sort of uh, training bases where I wasn't following uh, the immediate aftermath. You know, I was very mm-hmm. focused on like, the systems and the tactics and all of that. Um, so I feel like I missed <laughs> this 9-11 conspiracy um, phenomenon. And so that was really interesting um, to me to, to read about people who um, succumb to that thinking. Yeah, it, it is interesting, like, the variety, I think, of conspiracy theories that you have out there. Uh, you know, some some people, like, believe this one, some people believe this one. You know, people, like I say in the book, if you believe something at a certain level of extremeness, you generally believe other things. Yeah. But everyone has kind of a, a focus uh, that they 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 they. they that's their favorite conspiracy in a way. They become like 9-11 experts or chemtrail experts or UFO cover-up experts. And uh, they 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 devote an enormous, an enormous amount of time into uh, researching these things, which is quite fascinating because the amount of time they invest in it, I think, makes it a lot harder for them to get out of it because they're kind of, you know, they're the, the the sunk cost that they've put into researching it, they think it must be true because I researched it for several years. Uh, right. It's uh, fascinating people. And then what I, another thing that I really appreciated is how you made the connection with real harm. Uh, that it's you know not just this kooky uncle who believes these things and writes crazy social media posts about it, uh, but that you know by this kooky uncle not getting vaccinated or yeah. you know actually um exhibiting behavior that leads to the election conspiracy that leads to january 6th and uh you know real harm that that comes with it so that that was another thing that i appreciated that you uh again took these um took these threads and really made them explicit in terms of why we should care. Yeah, it's uh, it's always been uh, kind of. An, I think I've I've been consumed somewhat with UFOs in in recent years because it's just such a fascinating topic for me. But I'm, I'm always interested in these other conspiracy theories as well. And when I say other conspiracy theories, uh, you know, I think there are, there are conspiracy theories around UFOs that you know the government is covering things up. You know, some people will consider that. To be a fact rather than a conspiracy theory, but you know, it's not like the existence of UFOs isn't a conspiracy theory. We know that there are things flying around in the skies that we can't identify, and that there are various genuine concerns about them. But there are also are uh, various rabbit holes of belief that you can go down uh, with with the UFO UFO culture, uh, and you know, you see a lot of that online. There's a very diverse range of people. Uh, in these these discussions, and um, they're all they're all interesting. Mostly lovely folk, though. I, I met lots of nice people at the uh, the UFO conference I went to at uh, Alien Con in Pasadena. A lot of fun. Well, I, uh, hope, that we, I hope we'll get to meet uh, in person at one of these conferences soon, whether it's a, a UFO conference or a skeptic. Yeah, are, are, yeah. are you planning on going to any uh, UFO conferences? I, I don't have any, but I always appreciate the invitations. You know, again, this isn't a topic that I follow. <laughs> so right. uh, if if somebody has a suggestion or a recommendation, I um, will certainly consider it. And, and of course, if you uh, have something in mind, let me know. Maybe we can meet up at one. And I hope sure. that you'll, um, and it could be by Zoom, I hope you'll speak to one of my classes here when I have a, a critical thinking. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, 
discussion. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, that's been it's been a very interesting conversation. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything else that you think we haven't covered, or you wanted to uh, to, to talk or to say, or give, give no. a message out to the world? Yeah. But... Uh, I, no, really. Okay. <laughs> you no, know, I don't. I don't consider myself an evangelist on on this issue. But uh, you know, as I've said before, I, uh, as a military officer, you know, I, I feel a duty and an obligation to respond. And, curious and concerned citizens have questions about something that happened while I was on duty, uh, again, almost 20 years ago. Um, but then as you're doing, you know, I, I hope to encourage uh, folks to think critically, uh, stay curious, but also to stay grounded. That's great. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Thanks, Nick. Okay, Alex.